Hey, welcome back to Big Word Bible Studies. I am Tanya Dennis, and I'm absolutely delighted that you're here. I'm going to give a little preamble before we get started, though. You may hear a number of noises in the background. My kids are off from school, so my daughter's practicing piano while my son's playing baseball outside. And it is, of course, fall, gorgeous fall here in New Jersey. So you're going to hear one or many of my neighbors with their blowers. Um, I could wait for a perfect time where things would actually be quiet around my house, but, well, that's probably never going to happen. <laughs> So, um, yeah, let's dive in. Last night at our discussion, our in-home group, we talked about 2 Kings, chapters 14 through 16. Now, in that section, we met a number of different kings. Um, we had three major kings from the southern kingdom of Judah, and then we had a whole fistful of kings from the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, all the kings of Israel... They all did evil in the sight of the Lord. The kings of Judah, however, um, for the most part, they did the right thing. They walked in the ways of their fathers, and, and they obeyed God and honored God with one exception. And that exception was idolatry. They continued to, um, well, they kept those high places, those high places where the false gods and the false temples um, existed, and the people could go and worship other gods. Now... Now, let's take a look at some of these kings, okay? Amaziah was the first one that we discussed. He was 25 years old when he came to the throne. He reigned for about 29 years. Now, he came to the throne after his father was assassinated. There was a big palace conspiracy, and through the course of events, his father was killed, and he ascended to the throne to be the new monarch. Now, at first, um, he was nervous, so he starts building up his army, and he hired a whole bunch of people from Israel, a whole bunch of um, military people, who soldiers, who would come and help him fight. Well, the prophet came to him and told him, what are you doing? You're not supposed to do this. Is God not good enough for you? And so he's like, well, what am I supposed to do? I already paid for them. They're like, just send them back. Don't worry about the money. So he sends these soldiers back. They're, of course, not entirely happy because what happens next he attacks all these other areas, these uh, cities and nations, and he wins. And then, of course, the soldiers who are on his team get to split all of the plunder. So these guys from Israel who are, you know, hired and then fired, and, and they get nothing. So they're, of course, not entirely happy. He, meanwhile gets a slightly inflated head and decides that he's pretty cool. So he challenges the king of Israel. The king of Israel tells him, you know, this is not really a great idea. You're this little, you know, little thing that just squished something smaller than you. So don't think you can come up against me. I'm a lot bigger and stronger. So um, he says no. Amaziah, of course, full of himself, thinks, sure, let's do it. Come on. I'm not going to take no for an answer. And so... They get into battle, Amaziah loses terribly. And so that's the first thing. The next king we had was Azariah. Now Azariah was 16 years old when he came to the throne and he ruled for 52 years. Again, his father, who was Amaziah, was killed in another conspiracy where they everybody just got upset. So he was assassinated. Azariah comes up, takes over the throne when he's 16 years old, rules for 52 years. Now, the similar theme that we have here is that both of these men, both of these kings, came to power when they were quite young. 25, 16 years old, that's pretty young to be, you know, the ruler of a nation. They both had great success at the beginning, and then they both grew extremely prideful. Now, in their pride came their downfall. So, Azariah, same type of thing. He um, grew so prideful and arrogant because he did great things. He was rebuilding the temple. He's, you know, fortifying the cities. He's re -getting, um, reclaiming, uh, what was the city? Eloth, this port of which would definitely stimulate their economy and help out with everything there in his nation. So he's doing all of these great things. But it went to his head, and so he decides, well, I'm going to go into the temple, and I'm going to burn my own incense, and I'm going to do this. The priests, of course, tried to stop him, but it was too late. He had already been afflicted with some sort of skin disease. We could probably assume it's leprosy, but we don't know exactly. Some sort of skin disease that started on his forehead and eventually spread to the point of his death. So next, after that, the next king of Judah was... Um, Josh Jothan. Jothan came to power. He took over the throne when he was 25, had it for 16 years. Now, Jothan actually um, controlled the kingdom, controlled the um, 
the government while his father was so sick from this skin disease. So we don't know exactly how long he was in power, but he was official for just those few years after, um, after he turned 25. And the same thing with him. We have the persistence of idolatry and we have the, um, the presence of pride. And this pride that prohibited them from following God wholeheartedly. So these are the things that we discussed last night. Again, we had the kings of Israel too. And if you look at their stories as, um, as brief as they are presented, um, you can see the same thing. They were full of themselves. They were full of idolatry and they completely lacked a heart devoted to God, a heart that would follow God. Now we know from the dedication of the temple when back in, um, Back in 1 Kings, I'm sorry, the beginning of 2 Kings, when we had Solomon. Um, <clears throat> no, it was 1 Kings, I'm sorry. Back at, um, in 1 Kings, when Solomon dedicated the temple, we know that there was this great prayer and this um, condition put on God's... Um, I don't want to say his allegiance to the people because he was so long-suffering and, and so faithful to them and so loving to them in spite of all of their idolatry and all of their, uh, just all of this distraction that they had. But what he told them is that they would continue to be blessed and that their nation would um, pers persist as long as they followed him. But they had to follow him wholeheartedly. Well, they're not doing that. They were given the warning. They were given the, um, it was clear to them from the very, very beginning what the consequences would be if they did not follow God wholeheartedly. They didn't. And so now in these next few sections, we're going to see little by little, these pieces of Israel, these pieces of the nation are going to be pulled away, taken away by Babylon, by Assyria, by these other nations. And, And so what, what does any of this mean for us? What are we supposed to do about this information? Well, just as the people of Israel were called to be set apart for God, they were called to follow him wholeheartedly, so are we. So we have um, in the study guide that I provided to you, which if you didn't get it, you can download it free on my website, uh, tanyadennisbooks.com. Um, but in that study guide, the last section of the questions, I prompted you to look up a few verses. I want you to look up um, Romans 12, 1 and 2, Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 12, and then again, 1 Peter 1, verses 13 through 16. Now, these are just a few of the very many passages that we find throughout Scripture that give us this admonition to be holy. That's what we're called to do. We are called to be people set apart for God and for His purposes. Last night, uh, one of the women in our group, her name is Laura Lynn, and she shared with us a story that her dad, who is a Bible teacher, um, shares frequently uh, about the time when they were living in a different country. Now, they had this pot, and it was their holy pot. It was a sanctified pot, he called it, that was meant for boiling water. Now, when um, someone came over and made soup in the pot, every time they made water after that, the water tasted like soup. So they had to have a pot that was set aside for a very specific purpose. It was sanctified and holy pot just for boiling water. This, I love this illustration because it points out not only that if we're used for different purposes, it's going to taint what we're supposed to be doing, but that we are set aside for a purpose. We're not set apart just to be different. We are set apart for a purpose. And what is that purpose? To glorify God, to bring Him honor. And um, that's what we need to do. That's what we need to do. So the next question comes, how? How do we do that? The first part, there, there are two elements of this that we discussed last night. One of them is pursuing that which is good. We want to fill our minds with the things that are right and pure and lovely and, and trustworthy, the things that are true. We want to fill our minds with those things by studying scripture, by surrounding ourselves with people who are like-minded, who are also pursuing Christ, who, are, um, who will challenge us to be more and more like God has called us to be, who will prod us on toward that, that holy purpose for which we've been set aside. Now, 
the that's the one part. So we want to pursue that which is right and good and holy, that which is godly. And then the other side is we want to separate ourselves from that which is not. So we need to pursue godliness, but we also need to pursue purity by avoiding those things that will draw us away from our purpose. Avoiding those things that will taint our purposes. We don't want we don't want to taste like soup. <laughs> we we want to be godly and pure and holy so that God can use us for the exact purposes for which he created us. So those are, um, that's it. That's That was our discussion last night. I do not have the homework ready for you just yet, but I will, um, I will get it to you shortly. If you are not yet subscribed to our mailing list, please do that. Uh, on the website, tanyadennisbooks.com, if you go to the Big Word Bible Studies tab, down below the first video, there's an option there for subscribing to the mailing list. When you do that, you will automatically be added um, via email to all of our latest updates. You'll get everything, including the homework as soon as it is available for download. So go ahead and do that. Email me um, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, and go over to the blog. Leave some comments about uh, what you're discovering, what God is showing you through this passage and through these sections of his great big word. So thanks a bunch. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.